And he had discovered that inside Wirecard, there was a guy in the finance team who had been cooking the books. Not huge, huge amounts, but the more they looked, the more they found. My guest today is Dan McCrum. Dan is a multi-award winning journalist and author. His reporting for the Financial Times has been recognized with prizes from the London Press Club, the Society of Editors, and the Gerald Loeb Awards. When Dan got a tip to investigate the hot new tech company challenging Silicon Valley, everything about Wirecard looked a little too good to be true. As he dug deeper, he encountered a story stranger and more dangerous than he ever imagined. He wrote about it in his latest book, Money Men. It's the astonishing inside story of Wirecard's multi-billion dollar fraud, Europe's biggest new tech darling, revealed as a house of cards. I recently sat down with Dan and we talked about the inside story of Wirecard's multi-billion dollar fraud and how we uncovered that Europe's biggest new tech darling was just a house of cards. Dan, thanks so much for coming on the show. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And I want to tell you, I really am looking forward to our discussion today because I remember getting the FT, the Financial Times, seeing your articles where you were talking about uh, about a, a fraud of, well, you first asked questions about it, but I do remember following this in the FT as well as in the Wall Street Journal. And uh, it's just really, really exciting uh, story. And, and thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, well, thanks for having me on, Charles. It's a pleasure. Okay, folks, the name of the book is Money Men. And it's a hot startup, a million-dollar fraud, a fight for the truth by Dan McCrum. And this really is a fascinating story because a single guy, a FT journalist by the name of Dan McCrum, who's right here with us, he brought down a company that was, what did you say, 28 billion euros, 30 I think it was about 28 billion at the peak. 20, yeah. So call it $30 billion company that was built on fraud uh, manipulation and just a great story. And the executive team stole, I think it was what, $1.9 or $2 billion was missing? Yeah, $1.9 billion. They had to suddenly admit, oh, yeah, that money doesn't really exist anymore. Amazing. And, and I reckon they stole at least a billion dollars. Yeah, what, what, what fascinates me before we get into this is that this was hiding in plain sight. It was a public company trading in Germany on the DAX. And uh, public company, so they filed filings, they had offices, they had anything that, uh, everything that any major company would have. And it took a guy like you with a couple of good steers by smart people in the right direction to work at bringing down this company for the fraud that it perpetuated for close to what? I, I think, would you say 20 years or so, oh, two? 20, I mean, there was, the fraud was going on for at least 10 years. But yeah, the company had been around for 20 years. Right. And, uh, and I think the best way to think about it was like Europe's PayPal. Yeah, yeah. That was the way they pitched themselves. They were in payments. It was fast growing. It was exciting. Okay, good. So you know what? Let's do this. Let's let's start from the beginning, right? Because m- many Americans don't know about um, about uh, a Wirecard, what they did, what business they're in. Uh, by the way, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal. I remember front page. I think it was about Wirecard. It was a pretty big deal, was it? That was your article. I think. Did you write that? Oh no, I, I didn't write for the journal. I, I wrote for the Financial okay. Times uh, only. But uh, but yeah, I think the journal did cover it as well. Like it was a pretty big deal. It was a now. pretty big. It all blew up, deal, right? And what fascinates me, Dan, is I've had other people on the show uh, who, um, one was Key Man, which was the story of, um, of uh, Braj, how they went ahead and told, told the whole world that they were going to solve poverty by building businesses. And they took money from uh, the UN and they took money from Bill Gates and they all got snookered. They all got snookered. It was all a sham. And it just amazes me how fraud can be perpetuated for such a long period of time hiding in plain sight. It's kind of a timeless story, isn't it? I mean, there's always the people who are suckered in by, you know, the promise of something which is too good to be true. Yeah. How many times have we seen that? And uh, I mean, it, you know, the big corporate frauds, I mean, you saw it with Enron, um, and you know, there are shades of Theranos as well here. I mean, the chief executive in this case also liked to wear black roll top uh, jumpers, trying to uh, imitate Steve Jobs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's sort of, I, I, don't, I don't know what you, when you think about like 
the things that they have in common, these big frauds, you know, they spin a great story and then it works and people get rich and they become invested in the success. And that sort of blinds you to, you know, the questions that you should be asking. Yeah, it's not only the questions uh, that, well, yes, definitely the questions you should be asking, but the social proof of it that everyone looks around and says, you know what, they're public, they filed, uh, they have a great accounting firm, uh, you know, they have all the credentials needed. Uh, look, if they say these are the numbers, I'm not going to question them. Exactly. I mean, there's shades of Enron to this as well. You know, the company was much loved by stock market analysts and people made a lot of money. And, you know, you start to think you're pretty smart when you've made a bunch of money from a great stock trade. So you buy some more and you tell other people to buy it. Yeah, what's, what's, what continues to amaze me about these type of frauds is that they go on not only for the magnitude of the, of the money they extract from investors in the marketplace, but the length of time. These aren't a year kind of things. These goes on. They, these kind of things go on for years, and they keep. The, and, and you look back and you see all the red flags. But going through it, it takes a few people to shout out the emperor's naked, and still people investors kind of poo-poo it away. Yeah, I mean, well, this is the extraordinary thing about Wirecard and this story. Because we hear a lot about dirty money at the moment, right? You know, there's a lot of dirty Russian money being coursing through London. And Wirecard was the example of what happens when dirty money comes for you. Yeah. And so this wasn't just a case of someone going, hey, the emperor's got, new clo got no clothes and everything collapsing. This was a case of sort of, a modern financial institution using every tool that it had, as well as some that most don't have, including, you know, spies, hackers, private detectives, lawyers, to, you know, intimidate and bat away criticism. So I think there was a very real chance that they would have got away with it. Uh, it That's the crazy thing as well in, the, in these markets. Yeah, 100%, you know. Uh, so let's start from the beginning. Wirecard was a payment processor, and a payment processor, uh, you definitely chime in here, is really the grease that works through the financial system. They process payments when I swipe my credit card. What happens from there? That's a great example, the, the grease in the system. You swipe your credit card, and they get the money from your bank to the bank of the merchant, the person who's selling you something. And... Really, that's very simple. You know, if you get into the nuts and bolts of it, you know, there's a slightly complicated process, but it's as simple as that. They get your money to the person you're trying to pay. And that's a fairly straightforward business and loads of people around the world do it. And the thing that Wirecard did, though, which was very clever, and, you know, we see this a lot, they didn't brand themselves first and foremost as a bank or a payment processor. They were a technology company. And they were saying, hey, we're using technology to make the business of payments smarter and faster. And we can do all sorts of clever business around that. And, and that means we're going to be more profitable and we're going to grow right. faster than everyone it's else. It's like we were saying we're a technology company and all they were doing was subletting space. Right at the end of the yeah, day. Exactly. Yeah. So if you put a nice spin on something, wow, that's what they are. But really, the business is a pretty, sta pretty sane, really safe business in a sense. You're facilitating the payment between point A and point B. For that, you're taking out a small percentage, a couple of percentage points. And also, you're really, in a sense, to the bank, you're, you're responsible for making sure that there's no fraud on that end, meaning people aren't using that credit card or your, your system in order to uh, make payments and get away with it and charge backs where a customer says, I never ordered it and the card was charged and the money was already deposited in the account. That's what a payment process does. In, in a real world, it's a pretty simple business. Agreed? Yeah. There's a, Visa and MasterCard will license a whole load of these payment processes. They're called acquirers, if you want to know the jargon. And so when you call up your bank and say, hang on a second, I don't recognize this credit card payment, and they give you the money back. Wirecard was one of those payment processors who was responsible for 
getting that money back for you. Right, right. So that's why it's very important when they sign up. I know in our business, when we sign up with new letter, newsletters, payment processes go through a whole bunch of questions to you uh, and background checks because, you know, they're on the hook for the money if uh, they pay you and all of a sudden a zillion customers want to charge back and call up and say to the credit card company, give us back our money. And if I disappear, they're not getting their money. Yeah, and, and so that turns out to be quite an important cog in the whole sort of payment system, right? right? Because if you're, you know, your payment processor is doing the right checks to make sure that you're above board and upstanding and you're not like laundering money. Right. But if you're say a bit of a criminally a bit of a criminal company and you're prepared to process payments for all sorts of characters, then that kind of is a bit of an interesting opportunity for the payment processor. And that's where Wirecode came from. It came from doing the sorts of business which other people didn't want to do. Right. And it, so we did a lot of porn, a lot of gambling. Right. Pornography and gambling are two areas in the payment processing business where, let's say, a regular business, they charge a couple of percentage points for the transaction. So, folks, that means if you're swiping for a $500 uh, product, the payment processor is getting 2% or so or $10. Not a lot, but do this times multiple times, it's a lot of money that they're getting. And businesses, anyone owns a business and uses credit cards as, as a uh, means of getting revenue, sees at the end of the month a huge statement, you know, all those dollars <laughs> add up. And certain businesses, they charge really high rates, 8 9 10% because of the, such as pornography and such as gambling, right? They charge a high, high percentage on each transaction. Yeah, and, and there's reasons for that. Because pornography and gambling are risky businesses. There's a much higher chance that you're going to see that statement on your credit card or, you know, your wife or partner is going to see that and go, what's that? And you're like, oh, no, I don't know anything about that. I'm going to call up and counsel and complain. Or you might say, oh, I was ripped off at the online casino. Not to mention some of the, you know, the legal implications, like gambling isn't legal in a lot of countries. Right. So this is the hunting grounds that Wirecard went after. They went after the those in the shadows of the businesses which have a hard time getting payment processors. They, um, they uh, hung around with a lot of bad elements, did this business, said how profitable it was, and what was their spin on it? What were they basically telling the world? Well, so that's the, that's the thing. They weren't telling the world about any of this. So they had their roots in sort of the grimy, profitable business. And if you asked them outright, they would say, yeah, sure, we do a little bit of that, but we've moved beyond that. You know, most of our business is very respectable. We're doing consumer goods, you know, Wirecard process payments for a big grocery store chain, uh, Aldi in Germany. You know, they would, they would, every time they got a new com customer, they would put out a press release. Hey, we're processing payments for Orange, the mobile phone company, or, um, um, or things like that. And, and also they would say they were doing a lot of airlines. Again, a risky business because if an airline goes bust, hey, you've sold a lot of tickets and suddenly all those people are going to want their money back. And so it said it was doing that sort of business, but it was doing it very cleverly because it had the great technology. And it could do this better than its competitors. And so it was growing reliably 20, 30% a year. Which is astounding if you think about this business. It doesn't grow with that kind of rate unless you have everyone on planet Earth processing through you, which just doesn't, the growth is just not in that business. It's a pretty mature business, are we agreed? Well, it's one of those ones. Yeah, you're right. You can, it's really unusual to grow, but it's one of those competitive businesses where like, if you throw money at it, you can win a lot of customers and grow very quickly, but you're, you're, you're going to lose money. Right, you it. won't be profitable. So they had- Yeah, you won't be profitable. Right, so they had, they had both ends of the barrel taken care of. They had, they were, they were growing their revenue at an enormous rate and growing profits, which didn't make a whole lot of sense knowing what their business, what business they're in. Yeah, exactly. And so I, and so when I first came across them, I didn't know any of this. What happened was I, you know, I was a journalist at the Financial Times in London and I was looking for companies who 
numbers didn't quite make sense. Basically, you know, I wanted to find myself the next Enron. And I was looking for, you know, a bunch of small companies in the UK who's, you know, turned out to be accounting frauds. And so I started to chat to short sellers. And, um, and I was talking to one of these, an Australian guy called John Hampton, who likes to spin a tail. And he knows, well, he knew the sort of companies that I was interested in. And, um, and so we're chatting one day about this and that. And he suddenly goes to me, hey, Dan, would you be interested in some German gangsters? I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. And so he tells me about this payment processing company called Wirecard. And it's worth about 4 billion euros at the time. And that was when I started to learn all this about payment processing. So you didn't know anything about accounting. You're, you're not a financial guy. You're not an MBA. You're, you're, just, you're, an, just, you're an investigative <laughs> journalist, right? You follow where the trail leads and you learn along the way. Yeah, exactly. You learn by doing. I'd sort of, I, you know, the key to being a good journalist is you don't have to know everything. You just have to find sources who do know at least something about it. And then you ask them. Right. And I have to say, uh, you know, I've been a subscriber to the uh, FT Financial Times for a long, long time. And uh, your paper is just absolutely, I love it. You know, especially Lex, uh, which uh, has really smart people write two, 300 word essays on a company, on earnings, on something. And I always get a good idea. So, uh, folks, the FT is an orange looking paper. Uh, and uh, it looks well, we, we call it salmon pink, salmon but, uh, pink. Yeah. yeah, it's the one which is a funny color, funny color. But I want to tell you, they really have outstanding, outstanding journalists. These guys are really good. So, that's my two second plug for <laughs> FT. So, uh, because start with the weekend section, it has yeah. a lovely magazine about things you can buy. Yeah, we weekend sections just good, just all everything you know, just everything really about the FT. I like so. You now are pointing in the right direction with this German company run by gangsters. What year is this about? So this is uh, October 2014. Okay, October 2014, you'll all of a sudden get the scent. Someone, uh, a short seller. Now, I want to just point out here, short sellers, folks, do not put companies out of business if they don't deserve to be. So you could be a short seller against Google, and no matter how big a short seller you are, you will get hurt. You will lose money because Google is a reputable company with real money. Uh, short sellers make their money off of frauds or uh, companies which say that they're X and they're really much less than that. If the story is not real, a short seller will have an extremely hard time, if not impossible time, to just break even. But if the story is real, uh, short sellers can make a whole lot of money and they're extremely, extremely important for the financial ec uh, ecosystem. They're the uh, let's say the the hyenas, which go after the weak in the marketplace that look to deceive. And without short sellers, without short sellers, you could have people like Wirecard and a whole bunch of other unscrupulous dealers and CEOs bid up their stock forever if there's no mechanism to bring that back to earth. So uh, I don't want to get any comments or calls. You, you still do it. Uh, comments and emails saying, "Oh, short sellers bring down." They don't bring down companies. If a company, you you could short sell. You could try to try to sell short Berkshire Hathaway <laughs> or Microsoft. <laughs> You're not going to do anything. You're going to be pissing in the wind. It's it's not going to mean anything. Uh, companies which go down and go down hard. Usually, if there's if there's smoke, there's fire. And if there's smoke and it happens to be no fire, the company will rebound. So, uh, short sellers do not have the kind of magical power that many people think they do. If the story is. If the story is uh, real, uh, if the story is unreal, if the story is real, the, you know, the rest of the marketplace will destroy it. So I just want to cover that. So you get pointed in the direction of a company that sums things up. What's your next step? So I jot down the name Wirecard, like, oh, I should have a look at this. And, you know, John tells me a little bit more about it. And so far as he's concerned, he thinks it's a fraud. But he's also he thinks it's processing payments for all the bad stuff online, you know, sort of like he can't prove it, but you know, dark web nastiness, you know, you, you can imagine. And, but he doesn't have any proof because John's a sort of short seller who shorts a whole bunch of companies and he finds enough to convince him. And that's it. Then tiny bit of it's fun. But a couple of months later, another short seller, gets in touch. And I, I like what you were saying about um, 
the short sellers there because they're they're much misunderstood and this is something that wirecards used to its advantage later and so i get a call from this guy called leo perry and i go and meet him for a coffee and he's you know very unassuming you know classic hedge fund manager cashmere jumper um sort of slightly nerdy manner and he pulls out these handwritten or typewritten notes and sort of starts going through them. And he's got like, he's almost academic, like, you know, you meet these investors who are sort of get so into the detail. And what he really likes about frauds is if you're a short seller and you find a fraud, then you can get a real confidence that something's there that you can't with, you know, if you're trying to guess how many cars is Tesla going to sell, you know, that's a finger in the air kind of stuff. But if you can go, this company's a fraud, then you've got a good chance that at some point, the share price just goes all the way to zero. It's worthless. And so what he lays out is he says, I think Wirecard has been inflating its profits. And the way they're doing it is with a bunch of dummy companies in Asia. And what they do is they buy these companies and they're not really worth what they say they're worth. And they use all sorts of accounting trickery. You know, when you're buying a company, you can make sort of you can make things go away in the wash. It gives you lots of opportunity to sort of juice things if you're a bit unscrupulous. And he laid out this sort of trail of paperwork that he found in Asia saying, this looks like a fraud to me. So I go away and I have to repeat his work. I go and get all the paperwork. I sort of follow it through and I start looking and go, yeah, I think he's really onto something. And by the way, let me just something interject it then. Yeah. This is all publicly traded information, uh, publicly available information. You didn't have really anything that was uh, proprietary or, uh, or um, 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 that um, you know, someone from the inside gave you or anything to that effect. Is that more or less correct? Yeah, no, the amazing thing is you had to go looking for it. You know, and some of these filings of their you know, little subsidiaries in Asia, they weren't easy to find. But they were there. They were public. There was nothing secret about it. And he just did something very simple. He compared what was in those numbers, what was in those filings, to what Wirecard was saying in public. And the two things didn't match. And so I approached the company. I start, you know, saying, and to begin with, you know, you, you come in gently when you're doing this sort of work. You don't walk straight in and go, hey, are you fraudsters? That doesn't go down. You, well. you need to romance first. You need to romance yeah, them and tell them how great guy they are and great CEO. You're amazing. You walk on water. How do you do it? <laughs> exactly. But one of the funny things is like, so I, I approach Wirecard and normally fast growing young tech company and the Financial Times comes to want to talk to them. They're like, hey, yeah, Please. let's put our chief executive on the line. Let's have a chat. Wirecard was the complete opposite. They're like, oh, no, it's very difficult. I, Oh, no, we're doing our results at the moment. Uh, maybe you could come here and talk to like some minor manager. So that goes nowhere. So I send them a bunch of questions about their accounting, quite detailed, and suddenly their tone changes. And they're like, so are you in league with short sellers? Are you basically saying, am I corrupt or am I naive? And that's a big red flag. Like clearly right, you've hit when, a when you have there. nothing to nothing to hide, you, you, the media is not there, is there for you to use as a, as a great platform <clears throat> to send your message. But when you have something to hide and, uh, the first thing is you're being accused of being a short seller right there. There's, there's like, that's a big red flag. No. Yeah. Yeah. Big red flag. So, so we carry on talking to them, and eventually they do put the chief executive on the um, what's his, on the what's line. His name? We have what's his name? Uh, Marcus Brown, mm -hmm. and he has been he's he's painted as the founder of the company. He at this point he'd been running it for almost fifteen years, and you know it had been public. It went public in about two thousand and six. Tiny valuation, but you know it's one of those penny stocks which just keeps doubling and then doubling and then doubling. And, um, and so I talked to him and he does all the classic things, which liars do. So what are the, what are those things? What are those classic things? So if I said to you, are you stealing money? You'd be like, what are you talking about? I have never stolen anything in my life. You give like a very clear blanket denial. 
what liars do is give very specific denials. So you would say, no, there was nothing was stolen on that day. Or, um, and so, or he would take refuge in, um, you don't answer the question. What you do in what he said was, why would I do these things? I'm a very successful businessman. I've been running this company. I own a big part of it. All these analysts think I'm great. Why would I, why would I risk all that by trying to fake the numbers? And, and the funny thing as well was the tone was strange. Like he didn't get angry. I basically flat out asked him, you know, so what's going on here? Are you, are you juicing the numbers? Imagine this if, is one of the great. Imagine if someone walked, that, came up to you and, and basically called you a cheater and you're stealing money. Uh, you know, I'd punch you in the nose. That would be my first thing. To sit there and, <laughs> well, this, and carry on a conversation with you and try to, you know, uh, answer a whole bunch of other questions. You just insulted the guy. And if he has nothing to hide, like, how dare you? What are your facts? What are you? But you don't get that. You don't get that, right? Yeah. And by the way, that's one of the great fun things about being a journalist is that you occasionally get to uh, ask people very rude questions like that and they sort of have to put up with it. But um, but so I... I do the whole like rude question routine. And, and this is when? This is this is what? I, uh, this, this, is, this is December 2014. Okay, December 2014. So two months or so since you got the tip from the short seller that something fishy is about, uh, is happening at Wirecard. Yeah. And at this time, they are still the darlings of the investment community, especially in Germany. And the stock is just having a field day. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, continue. I'm sorry to interrupt you. And so, so as far as everyone can tell, very successful little fintech company. And, and he starts explaining to me in a tone of like, do I really have to tell people this again? No, we're not a fraud. No, we're a, just a misunderstood company. And he sort of, you know, it's like he, like he has to do this all the time to explain that he's not a criminal. And again, so that was just one of those. And the thing was, you know, they explained away all the technical questions and, you know, they had answers to things because they'd had time to prepare. It's, um, it's actually one of the things I always remember uh, Carson Block, the short seller, telling me is, um, you know, a management can always come up with a lie if you give them enough time. And, um, and so they explained it all away. And so I was kind of left with a bit of a, with a bit of a problem, like, how do I even write the story? And in the end, I wrote sort of a bunch of blogs for the FT's um, blog called FT Alpha. Wait, wait, but hang on, hang on. The, Before that, that's, yeah. you do that in April is your first one, right? April 27th. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I jumped so, ahead Okay, there. so you jumped, yeah, because I wanted, this I think is crucial because before you even write it, you have to go through a whole bunch of uh, uh, hurdles with your legal team because you're basically yeah. going to, you're going to call out a multi-billion dollar company, a multi-euro dollar, whatever it might be. Uh, that is the darling of the analysts of the, of, of the financial community in Europe, and you're calling these guys out for fraud. That's a big, big, big accusation. Because even if it's, if it's not fraud and you're totally wrong, you damaged, you caused some reputational damage to that company, and the paper can be liable, right? Yeah. And, um, and over here, we have some pretty strict libel laws mm -hmm, as well. Mm -hmm. and you can get in a lot of trouble. Right. Right. Okay. So now it's now you meet the you meet the CEO. You meet Marcus. Marcus, right? Yeah. So I meet Marcus. We have this. Um, well, it's a phone call um, for about two hours, and um, so I do this long interview and you know dutifully write down all the things he says about this very complicated, interesting business of his. And I sort of go away and I try and turn this into a story, but the lawyer basically says to me, "Well, what evidence have you got?" I said, like, well, it looks a bit fraudy. You know, everything smells, but there was no, there was no smoking gun. There was nothing I could point to. So he said, so he's like, well, you definitely can't use the word fraud because that'll get us sued to oblivion right away. So he suggests that I present this as a puzzle to the readers. You know, why is Wirecard like this? Why does it do these funny little deals? And so I wrote, basically a string of stories saying, you know, something about this doesn't quite make sense. The numbers don't quite look right. What could be going on? And so you don't have anything really 
in your you don't have any any smoking gun yet. You just have a good you have a good idea of something is going on, but you don't have any proof, right? Yeah, and um, yeah, we, we I go away and you know I go back to Leo Perry with some sort of ideas because you know people start reading the stories and saying, hey, maybe this, maybe that, and we come up with a whole theory that this is how the fraud is working. This is the big sign that uh, says, you know, I think some of these sales are fake. But again, we it, it, to be honest, there were there were some quite dense technical stories which probably I could have written a bit <laughs> a bit clearer with the benefit of hindsight. Okay, so now what happens on what what hurdle do you have to go through for this first story that you have on FT Alphaville, uh, the House of Wirecard, which they uh, finally allow you to publish after going through legal on April twenty seventh, twenty fifteen, which really starts the ball rolling. So, um, so that one, yeah, I have to get it signed off by the lawyers and by my editor, Paul Murphy. And then, uh, and that sort of, that signals to the world, hey, I'm interested in this story. And, you know, maybe there's something a bit fishy going on with Wirecut. And that, that's what starts to generate a little bit more interest. Gotcha. So you put out this first story, The House of Wirecut. Uh, a few, what happens then? So I read a bunch of stories. They raised, you know, some issues which pe- prompted some attention for the company. And, you know, people like hedge funds like them, accounting nerds like these stories. But really in terms of sort of the wider impact, nothing much happened. But it prompts um, a couple of short sellers to go away and do some more work. And then they suddenly pop up with this new theory. So I've been focusing very much on the accounting fraud. And these uh, short sellers go away and they become much more interested in the money laundering side of things. And they start finding all this evidence they think that is saying, hang on, basically when when online poker got outlawed in the US, all the other payment processors said, oh no, we're not gonna carry on doing that because that's now flat out illegal. But Wirecard carried on and so it was basically money laundering money for these online poker players. Right. But, but Wirecard is pretty clever. They say that poker really doesn't fall into the gambling classification because it's a game of skill, right? Yeah. So, so this was one of the big debates that was going on. <clears throat> is it a game of skill? In which case, hey, maybe it's legal. Or is it gambling, online gambling, in which case, no. Congress definitely said you're not allowed to do that. And and so so I get approached by um, these short sellers saying, hey, we've done this big report and we're going to publish it. And um, it's going to finally expose the truth about Wirecard. So I'm going to have to admit, I got a little bit overexcited at this point. What year is this? So this is uh, February 2016. Okay, 2016. We're still a long ways. We're still another four more years yeah, yeah, before yeah. this comes. So you already put up a flag. You you hoist a flag and say, there are red flags. Something's wrong with this company. And at the same time, the company defends itself. The stock price continues to rise. Uh, profits and revenue continue to soar. I think you, there were about a couple of billion dollars when you started this process. And now it's, it's close yeah. to the tens or uh, by February uh 2016, uh, not even then, wow, even earlier than that, it's, um, you're looking at a $4 billion, 4 billion euro, yeah, 4 billion, the share price continues to rise, and, and it continues to rise, and keep going higher and higher, so you, you now have, you, you now find more and more and more information, why don't you think, why is the stock price continuing to go up? Well, so why can't just waves it away? And they keep doing more of these deals, which um, their investors love. So they go and announce they've bought this big payments business in India. And, you know, they don't really focus on the details of the business. They spend the whole time going, India is a really big country and it's growing really fast. And by the way, it's uh, modernizing really quickly. So payments is going to be a really big part of that growth. 
So that's what we're doing. We're sticking our flag in India and it's going to be great for us. And but what, what they're really doing is buying these payment processing companies, which really are nothing more than, I don't know, a lot of them are just, they're paying enormous amounts of money for stuff that is what, worth nothing <laughs> or pretty little, right? <laughs> but it's just, it's just that it gives them a beachhead in order to start their press machine. It, and the amazing thing about it is because payments is intangible. So by this point, people are suspicious. They go and look for some of these businesses why I kind of buy. But the problem is, even if you knock on the door and say, this doesn't seem like a very big business, you don't have many staff here. Well, why is like, well, we're doing all this great business. You know, we're processing lots of payments and it's digital. You just can't see it. It's all flowing through the ether. And, um, and our auditors, Ernst and Young, they've checked everything and it's all above board. So you've got nothing to worry about. So how are the auditors signing off on that? So this is a very good question. The, what I learned as I was writing the book is that I think if you're an auditor, you invest a lot of time and energy to learn a lot of complicated things. And so there's this moment later on with Wirecard where, um, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of suspicions being raised. There's another accounting firm is being bought in to check their work. And even some people inside Wirecard are going, I'm not really sure about all of this business. Does this all really make sense, what we're telling the world? And uh, what, one of the Wirecard guys in that meeting tells me, EY stands up and say, yes, we really understand Wirecard's business. We realize it's not the tidiest. They're not really strong a procedure, but, you know, it's a fast growing company. We understand the growing pains of startups. And I think we've got a grip on how all of this works. And they seem to think they understood the business better than Wirecard's own stuff. And so the only sort of the most optimistic theory I can think about of what went wrong is they basically became captured. It was a kind of like intellectual bias where you're like, I've done all of this work. I've really understood the business and, you know, I'm the one who gets it. When do the wheels start to fall off? So, um, so for Wirecard, the big moment is September, 2018. Um, it enters the DAX 30 and it replaces this staid old investment bank called Commerce Bank. And it's kind of hailed as the next big thing. And I think the thing to understand here is um, Germany's got loads of amazing manufacturing companies, you know, BMW, Daimler, Siemens, you know, if, it, if it's being bashed out of steel, steel and it's highly engineered, Germany is excellent at it but it doesn't have a lot of big tech companies, you know? So, you know, Europe in general looks at the West coast of the U S and it looks at Asia and goes, where are all our tech companies? And along comes Wirecard and says, Hey, we're a technology company and we're going to be involved in the arrival of the cashless society. That was its big pitch. Yeah, so, you know, we're going to stop using notes and coins. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a great, it's, once again, it's a great story. Uh, you know, FinTech, and uh, the rise of apps, and we're not a cashless society, all the buzzwords, uh, the credibility of being a DAX, part of the DAX uh, 30, uh, history of 10 plus years, big name accounting, it had all the trappings to suck everybody in. And it's a really simple story as well, isn't it? You know, we're all gonna, we're all gonna stop using cash money and start using digital pay. And, you know, they talked a good game about using artificial intelligence as well. And, you know, all of that good stuff, buzzword, ping. And so, so at that moment, it's, you know, the company's moment of triumph. It's one of the 30 biggest listed companies in Germany. And about a month later, I get an email into my inbox from a would-be whistleblower. And it says, would I be interested in wrongdoing at a big financial company doesn't say anything about who it is and this is one of the amazing things about being a journalist it can be a clear blue sky and suddenly 
someone turns up with a tip. And they had seen the stories that I'd written about Wirecard previously and decided that I was the person to get in touch with. So I get on the phone and it turns out the person who got in touch isn't the whistleblower themselves. It's the whistleblower's mother. And so her son is a lawyer who had been working at Wirecard in Singapore, which is its Asian headquarters. And it turned out he had been forced out. And he was busy looking for a new job. You know, he wanted to get on with his life. But she knew everything that had happened to him. And she was determined that Wirecard was not going to get away with it. And so she started getting in touch with journalists. And I responded. And, uh, and when the guy, his name is Pav Gill, when he found out, he was like, Mom, what have you done? And, um, but the thing was, he was also angry because he had done his job. He was sort of general counsel for the whole region. And he had discovered that inside Wirecard, there was a guy in the finance team who had been cooking the books. Not huge, huge amounts, but the more they looked, the more they found. And he'd been sort of, you know, backdating contracts, faking invoices, doing weird little schemes to move sort of 2 million euros from one country to another. And that's a serious thing, you know? Someone sending 2 million euros out the company on bogus reasons, you would expect them to do something about it. And so they, he and his colleagues, and they hire a law firm, they do a quick investigation, and they realize more money's about to go out of the company. And so they send everything they found to head office in Munich, basically do a big presentation going, these guys are crooked, and we've got a real problem on our hands here. And in Germany, they say, oh, thank you very much. Thanks for telling us about this. Uh, we'll take over now. And very quickly, he realizes that nothing's going to happen at all. And all the guys under investigation seem to know about it. And his position quickly becomes untenable and he's forced out. And that's the moment when his mum gets in touch. And so I fly to Singapore. And we have a couple of clandestine meetings. I mean, I go to meet him in the lobby of a hotel. It looked like the inside of a starship. It's one of those weird sort of Singapore business hotels. No natural light whatsoever. And so I sit down at about 10 o'clock in the morning. And at this point, I've been looking at Wirecard for years from the outside. And suddenly I've got a guy on the inside and he starts telling me how it all works. And he starts like sketching out, you know, org charts and people's names. And, you know, it's all incredibly complicated. But slowly he just starts telling me this incredible tale. And the thing is, it wasn't just his word. Because when they fired him, they didn't escort him straight from the premises. What they did is that they would, you know, they basically told him to see out the week. And in that bit of time that they gave him, he took a little hard drive into work and copied all the files from this internal investigation. Wow. 70. And, uh, and that was what he had to give me. And so you publish on January 30th in the FT, execs at Wirecard suspected of using forged contracts. And what happens after that article? So the first thing that happens is Wirecard says, this is completely not true. No basis to it whatsoever. And we're like, brilliant. Like, that's the most stupid thing they could say, because we've got loads more evidence. And they've just given us a really good justification to publish it. Because one of the, one of the surprising things about doing this sort of work is how hard it is to publish these stories, because I had loads and loads of evidence, but because it had been conducted by lawyers, it's something called legally privileged. And so there was a big question about, well, do we have a good justification to publish all this stuff? And by immediately lying and saying, no, none of this is true, there they gave go. that to us. There you go. So you publish this article 
Uh, I do remember reading this because this really, when you when you write the word fraud and you name the company, it's game over. You're all in. You're all in at this point. Yeah. <laughs> There's no, you know, you, the missiles are flying. There's no turning them back now. You just accuse this company of being a fraud. And so the stock price drops by about, well, the, the value of the company drops by about 8 billion euros pretty quickly. Which was right around 30, 40%, if I recall. Uh, yeah. So it, like- it dropped to that sort of order of magnitude. Right. And so you're like, yeah, don't go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So you're like, blimey. Okay. That's quite a big deal. Okay. Um, and then something weird happens. The company says it thinks market manipulation has been going on. And you're like, okay, fine. That's kind of weird. And then an investment bank puts out an analyst report saying, ah, yes, this is clearly the Financial Times is in cahoots with short sellers. And um, this is that criminal Dan McCrum. And I was a bit, I thought it was a joke. But it turns out what the company did is faced with this sort of big reveal of what had been happening in its Singapore office, it decided the best thing to do was say, I'm in league with short sellers, and I've done this to try and um, manipulate the share price. Hoping the share price, selling the stock short and hoping the share price would plunge, therefore you could buy it back at a cheaper price and make a boatload of money. And that's what they're accusing you. And I I think, I don't know what your, what your, um, your um, your policies and procedures are in your company, but I, I in FT, but I believe something to the extent you cannot invest in or buy or sell stocks that uh, you're investigating. Is that right? Oh yeah, I I haven't traded right. an individual stock like my entire career. Right, right. But you're but um, you're, it's, you're in cahoots with the short seller. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm in cahoots with the short sellers, and to begin with, we're kind of laughing at it, going. Well, this is the same playbook because this is what the company had done time and again. Every time it was attacked by critics, it said short sellers, nothing to it. And it was it was all dismissed. What was kind of weird was then the German government joined it. So a couple of days afterwards, I mean, the day afterwards, I think, sort of the equivalent of the SEC, uh, Baffin, the German regulator, says, yes, we're going to investigate these claims of market manipulation. You're like, going, all right, that's a bit weird. You don't, no, don't, what about the accounting fraud? I don't think it was Carson Block. Uh, maybe, it was, maybe it was him, maybe it was someone else, where uh, he did the same thing with Chinese stocks. And uh, was, it, was it Carson Block? Uh, uh, yeah, he did the same thing with Chinese what stocks. Was name of, what's the name of his company? I, 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 uh, he is Muddy Waters. Right. Muddy Waters said that these Chinese, I think it was Sino Forest. He started, oh, Sino Forest was the big first was the one. the big yeah. first one with Paulson. He said it was just a fraud, and, and it was a fraud. And uh, Hong Kong, uh, at the time, um, barred him or did some really nasty things to him. Saying, and here's a guy, he was proven to be right, but the regulators were even sucked into the fact of, uh, you know, uh, uh, championing the company against all these accusations until they turned out to be wrong. Uh, the... The company, the the regulators were totally wrong, which it just boggles my mind that um, if the people who are watching the 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 guards are watching the inmates, and they're siding with the inmates against people who are just researching this stuff, it just as an investor, don't you feel like a little uncomfortable uh, when you're wondering whose interest do they have at heart here? Yeah, it's really hard to understand. I think in this case, there was a bit of circling of the wagons. You know, this big German company, which was, you know, their exciting new technology giant, had suddenly been attacked by foreign speculators. And and Wirecard gave them a very good example of this. So it put together this uh, witness statement from a guy in London who turned out to, um, he had a bit of a shady past. He'd been convicted for hiding, I think, £126,000 worth of uh, money from a drug gang underneath his daughter's bed, which the police found when they raided his house. 
Um, and he was married to a um, a celebrity uh, a celebrity TV um, uh, person. And so they found this guy who gave who gave a witness statement saying, "Oh well, he had heard that the story was coming that morning when we first published." Um, and Wirecard took that and gave that to prosecutors in Germany. Now. The prosecutors don't seem to have looked into this guy's history. They just described him as a, a trader, not, you know, a convicted drug gang, drug money guy. And he didn't even sign it. But they gave this unsigned witness statement to the German prosecutors, and they announced a big criminal investigation into me and one of my colleagues at the Financial Times. And then they do something which they had only done before during the financial crisis. They institute a short selling ban to protect Wirecard from speculators. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And just because we're running out of time, uh, Dan. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, no, I'm, no, no, I'm far too long winded. No, this. this is really amazing. This is stuff that you just don't believe. It's stranger than fiction. Uh, and uh, But it actually happens. So then you write another article, October 15th. Uh, Wirecard's, uh, Wirecard's suspected practices. Uh, I'm sorry, what was it? Uh, Wirecard's. Uh, yeah, a, 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 suspect a, accounting practices right, revealed. Right, revealed, and this, and th we're now at the beginning of the end. It's it's over for them. Uh, the stock price starts to plunge. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, it's the curtains pull back, and it kind of progresses rather quickly. Uh, I think a few months later, I think in twenty twenty, could you just take us forward? What happens there? They they, they start going in and scraping and finding out all this money's missing. So, so, so in October 2019, we basically plunge in the knife. We write the story saying, this is how Wirecard is committing the fraud. These are the fake customers which don't actually exist. And what we did is we published all the documents so the whole world could see for themselves that what was really going on. And it basically laid bare that, you know, this whole thing was a big fraud. But what Wirecard did was it announced it would investigate itself. So the police didn't do anything. It said, we'll bring in another accounting firm, KPMG, to do a special audit to check the work of the first accounting firm, Ernst & Young. And so this goes on, and this is going to take six months. So they buy themselves six months of time, and they go away, and we're waiting and waiting. And they come back, and the amazing thing is, KPMG comes back and says, yeah, we, we couldn't actually find any proof of these customers. Yeah, and, 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 and the company still doesn't really collapse at that point. What's the final, what's of, the final nail in the coffin when the company just, uh, it just all unravels <laughs> and uh, the CEO was wanted and, and uh, taken into custody. And I think the CFO is still somewhere out there and wherever it cannot be found, right? <laughs> Yeah, so, so it comes down to, okay, are the auditors going to sign off on the accounts? And um, Wirecard has claimed that there's 1.9 billion euros in banks in the Philippines. And so EY says, well, can you just transfer some money from there to here just to prove it? You're a payments company, right? This should be straightforward. And they promise they're going to do it, and it takes a while, and nothing, nothing actually happens. And so in the end, instead of announcing their results, uh, they announce, ah, EY cannot confirm that this 1.9 billion euros of cash really exists. And it's like the rug is suddenly pulled back and the entire thing collapses. Okay, and, now and within a week, mm -hmm. it's filed for insolvency and uh, the chief executive has been arrested. Okay. So now where are we now in, the, in this process? Now that was October, that was 2020, right? So now where are we yeah. two years later? Um, so, so this guy, Marcus Brown, the chief executive, he's going on trial later this year um, for gang fraud, for basically masterminding it. Uh, but the guy who's missing is uh, Jan Marslek, his sort of younger sidekick. They're both Austrian. Marcelik's about 10 years younger. And so Brown is this very dry, aloof, sort of austere character. He doesn't really talk to anyone, doesn't socialize with anyone, um, and has run the company for two decades. Marcelik is the total opposite, like charismatic, 
charming life and soul of the party, you know, the wonder kid. And he's the one who's been, so Marcus Brown sits in Munich, not very doing very much in a head office. And Jan Marslake's the one who sort of runs around the world, keeping the plates spinning. And, um, and so Wirecard collapses on, I think, a Thursday or a Friday. And uh, the police don't show up. It's sort of at this point, it's still, you know, very much a stock market matter. The share price has collapsed. Everyone's freaking out. Um, and Marslack is basically allowed the next day to catch a private flight to Belarus. And then he disappears. And um, he's still there so far as we know. And what we've learned since is, um, is that it turns out he had some very interesting friends in sort of Austrian intelligence and also Russian intelligence. Yeah, absolutely amazing. So the trial is headed for the end of this year for uh, Marcus. And so for Marcus and a couple of his sort of key um, accomplices, right. alleged accomplices, yeah. I should say. Folks, uh, the book is Money Men by Dan McCrum. And Dan just really touched the surface as to this journey, which took him <laughs> five or six years. We didn't talk about the threats to his life, his paranoia, which wasn't so paranoia, which was really how much paranoia of uh, thinking that people were after him. A whole bunch of shady characters, pornographers, uh, gambling. You, you got the really the, the, the ash heap of, uh, of, of finance in this mess. And it took one guy, not a whole team, which is, that's, that's also amazing, the power of the pen or the power of the computer, really, of, of how if you find fraud, if you do your homework, uh, you could really learn a lot from public filings, but 98% of people don't even bother reading them. That's what I've always found. It's just absolutely amazing. So if invest, if, folks, if you invest, you have a tremendous edge by just reading financial filings because I guarantee you 98% of them don't. And as Jimmy Rogers, famous uh, commodity, uh, really hedge fund manager said, if you want to be ahead of 98% of the people, read the annual report. If you want to be ahead of 99% of everyone else, read the footnotes. Nobody reads them. <laughs> and and I think, Dan, you're, 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 you're great proof of that and how you've help the investment community and uh, driven out a very, very bad player. And uh, who gets hurt? You know, shareholders. Shareholders left holding the bag. Uh, you know, mom and pops who bought stock and in institutions who should have known better, who managed pension funds and a whole bunch of other money of, 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 uh, of investors. Uh, that's the crime. I think uh, their due diligence, they're lacking. And uh, uh, this is a story that continually just, it doesn't repeat itself the same way, but it just rhymes. Exactly. Yeah. Well, what's next for you, Dan? Uh, well, there's a there's a documentary coming out in the autumn, I think, on a streaming service you may have heard of, and um, and yeah, the book is coming out. Uh, well, this is coming out when the book is out, right? So um, the book um, I'm going to be frantically trying to tell everyone about, and then. Um, well, I've got a couple of stories up my sleeve I'm working on. Have you become a, have you become a magnet for people uh, now that you have this kind of visibility for a lot of other whistleblowers? You're getting a lot of good tips on uh, other um, of companies that are just not doing the right thing. Yeah, I mean, one whistleblowers now know where to come, and you know, this is this is testament really to the whistleblowers. This whole story, like none of it could have happened, and um, they aren't treated well enough. Wow. But um, yeah, no, I'm very grateful for, yes, all of the Folks, if you're listening and you're at a company you work for is doing something really, really bad, Dan McCrum's the man who could put it on the front page. And uh, if you have a really good story, I'm sure he'd be interested. So Dan, I want to Please thank you. Please do get in touch. Yeah, definitely. Dan, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. The book, folks, is Money Man. I hope this book sells a lot, a lot of copies because I think for the investment community, I know it makes great reading. But for the investment community, you should always be asking the hard questions. And when something looks too good to be true, it usually, 99% of the time, it really is. And, uh, you know, you've proven that. You've just another, another story. And, and by the way, just on a side before I close, I love doing these kinds of stories. I love doing these kinds of uh, podcasts because um, 
it's really David versus Goliath. And uh, it's one guy with seeing something out there that doesn't smell right and pursues it. And uh, the small guy can win. You know, it's all out there. It takes a, a lot of time, a lot of effort, uh, a lot of perseverance, and uh, you have to go over through a lot of obstacles. But in the end of the day, the financial system does work, although it takes a lot of time sometimes to take down these companies. But hopefully, you know, in, in the case, uh, the, the truth will prevail. Dan, I want to thank you for coming on the show and lots of continued success to you. Great. Thank you very much, Charles. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Charles Mizrahi Show. If you're a new listener, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, we're glad to have you back. Either way, we'd love to know what you think of the show. Please leave a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Reviews make it easier for others to find the show. You can also see the video of the interview on The Charles Mizrahi Show channel on YouTube.